it's my 50th horror movie video. Counting the top six lists and the stuff that I recorded at the Cinema Arts Center, this is officially the 50th entry in the 13 Days of Halloween series. What started off as a stupid excuse for me to talk about how awesome the thing was around Halloween has blossomed into a yearly tradition that's honestly my favorite thing to produce all year. And so to celebrate in style, I thought the most appropriate thing that I could do was look back at the first film that I talked about in the series, 1985's Reanimator. My first video on Reanimator was only three minutes long. I've gotten a little bit better at rambling since then. So I went ahead and looked back on it and I figured that for this video, there were some things that I could definitely elaborate on from the 1985 film. And I was wrong. I think I covered pretty much everything. Yeah, I talked about the vibrant color scheme, the memorable characters, the brilliant effects, the batshit crazy antagonists. But if there's one thing I didn't really go into detail with, it's the series of Reanimator, because there were sequels. The first sequel came out a few years later, and it was directed by the producer of the original, Brian Usna, who had just come off of directing the incredibly bizarre film Society. In this film, there's more than a few returning cast members, some interesting new faces, and even some great characters that were dead that are making some guest appearances. But with the original director gone and a completely new writing staff, this couldn't possibly be as crazy as the first one, right? <laughs> <laughs> Roll it! The Bride of Reanimator picks up almost a year after the ending of the first movie, with Dean Kane and Herbert West surviving the events from the first film, and now they're both employed full-time at Miskatonic University Hospital. No, I can't tell you how they got those jobs. But now with a quicker access to bodies and supplies, they get to work on not only bringing the dead back to life, but also animating separate parts, some of which are sewn together in new and disturbing fashions. They also go about making a completely new body for Dean's deceased girlfriend, Meg, using the only body part of hers that's still available as a basis, her heart. Help me to continue the work. I like that this isn't a direct sequel to the events of the first movie. The first film ended on a cliffhanger and gave you the idea that it was going to pick up pretty much immediately on a reanimated Meg. But I like that they took a cue from one of the original short stories and instead follow Herbert West going to a battlefield. We may never again have access to this volume of fresh subjects. Fascinating. There's somebody here. Because if you're a crazy scientist with a knack for dead bodies, you go where the war is. But it turns out that's only kind of a detour. They didn't really need it after all because... They just returned to work at Miskatonic, and now they have an easier time finding experiments. Not only do they have access to the morgue again, but they live right next to a cemetery. Sounds like rats in the wall. Ha! I got that reference now. Reanimator was a groundbreaking film in terms of brightly colored, graphically intriguing visuals. And this one, while taking on a slightly darker and moodier tone, is just as crazy. The reanimated body still splurred out gallons of blood from every orifice, the skin looks jaundiced and discolored, and they still have that same respect for personal boundaries. But whereas the first film was more interested in making dead people and animals move around again, this movie's focus was on making new life out of dead tissue, sometimes from different animals glued together. Like, alright, if you know the first movie, you knew that the minute they shot that dog for longer than a second, he was dead. Angel. You do feel bad for the dog, but at least he knows how to shake now. Oh. The creature effects are also a smidge more creative this time around because they're actually playing into the Frankenstein thing instead of skirting around it. Some of the creatures from the original movie actually survived the bloodshed at the end, and some of them actually got locked up in a mental institution. There aren't a shortage of regularly reanimated zombies, my favorite is the police officer who's investigating the experiments and turns into one himself, but my favorite thing about him is that he stays in character as a police officer and tries to zombie-style arrest West. <laughs> but if this is a sequel where we're trying to up the ante, we need newer stuff. Crazier stuff. Get back! How dare you! 
<laughs> Stuff like that. Herbert's new experiments are so gruesomely satisfying. They all have this creepy ass fused together quickly design that you'd believe only an amateur just toying around with life and death would have the time to make. There are all sorts of crazy designs like the man with four feet, the half and half body. My favorite, however, is the body that's sewn together right down the middle. Like, have you ever seen the remake of 13 Ghosts where that dude gets killed by the sliding glass? Imagine that guy, but twice. And of course, we can't talk about the creations from Weston Kane without talking about the bride herself. Alive. The process looks so thrown together at the last minute, like West wasn't interested in making the body look attractive or normal, he just wanted parts that fit in a head to put it all together. A sculptress? A harpist? Would you believe? A murderess? Speaking of which, let's actually talk about the living characters in this, because they run the gamut anywhere from brutally insane to hysterically cynical. Just like the original. You... Butcher! How dare you judge my work? And as opposed to the last film where you feel like West and Hill were the most insane people on the planet, and there were sane, rational people around them, everybody is crazy in this movie. Anyone with access to the serum for longer than a minute wants in on the experiments. Police officers who are meant to be the good guys in this may have secretly killed their wives. Your wife died of multiple contusions to the head. No. From a blunt instrument. No. Multiple blows she to the fell. head. Ha. She fell, did she? Dean Cain is again played by Bruce Abbott, and he's really evolved since the first movie. And by that, I mean he's even more neurotic and hyper-emotional, and it's great. I'm calling it. No! Not again. The whole movie is halfway centered around Dean's inability to deal with the loss of Meg from the first movie, and we're meant to assume that the reanimation from the first film just plain didn't work. There was actually a deleted scene that was meant to show that, but it was cut, and I think it's for good reason. Now, Barbara Crampton didn't return for a cameo as Meg in this movie. Apparently, by this point, she was actually a little bit more successful. She'd been on The Young and the Restless, and her agent told her not to because it was below her. But I really hope it's the same agent who told her, yeah, say yes to Chopping Mall. Thank you, and have a nice day. So rather than just recast the part, the story instead revolves around Meg's heart being the base for a new body. Dean's also been projecting his emotions on this terminally ill patient in the hospital, so West grabs her head and they put it atop this crazy scraped together mannequin of body parts and she becomes the new Meg. Your girlfriend doesn't stand a chance. <laughs> Our girl is superior. Now in the review where I talked about the Bride of Frankenstein, I trashed the bride herself. And I will stand by that. Because iconic look aside, she did nothing. She stood in place, she didn't emote, and she screamed. This one, however, is great. You see her react to her new place in the world, she instantly falls in love with Dean, and the minute that he realizes that he's gone too far, and he sides with his new, actually living love interest, she literally breaks down emotionally and physically. Her body breaks down as the tissue rejects the head, and she breaks apart, holding out her own heart in her hands. This is a real Bride of Frankenstein. I have taken refuge of your God's failures, and I have triumphed. There, there is my creation. And I didn't think it needed to be said, but I'll say it anyway. Yeah. Herbert West is still the greatest character in the series. She's terminal. She's a patient. She could be of use to us, Dan. Not us. You. I'm a doctor. Well, be a scientist. He's just as crazy, only now even more so. He's less fascinated and slightly horrified by his own discoveries, and now he's kind of bored. He's just bringing people back from the dead and tinkering around with new experiments, trying to make unusual crap in his basement. 
it's almost like the process of bringing people back to life is mundane to him. So he has to make it more interesting. You just still don't understand, do you? This is no longer about just reanimating the dead. We will create new life. And yeah, with the writing still just as sharp as it originally was, the moments where he commands the screen with his snappy lines and his angry berating are unbelievably entertaining. Just dead tissue, but in our hands, it's the clay of life. And it culminates in an ending where he completely gives into his god complex, angry at the bride for showing attraction to Dean, even though that was always supposed to be the point. I will not be shackled by the failures of your god. The only blasphemy is to wallow in insignificance. It's kind of amazing how in the space of just two movies, West cemented himself as the perfect cult horror icon. He's got the look, he's got the clear motivations, twisted personality, he shifts between good and evil with reckless disregard, and most importantly, He's fun. You're nothing but a dead head. A no body. Oh, God, how did I forget this? Speaking of fun characters, look who's back. <laughs> Damn you, West! Yep, even though he was basically crushed into a paste at the end of the first movie. The head and brain of Dr. Hill survives. I have some unfinished business, and you will assist me. Both Hill and the Doctor of Pathology who bring him back to life, they have some of the most incredibly entertaining scenes where they argue back and forth, they fight over what's going to happen next. Hill's head is also a lot more coherent and less simple-minded than in the first one, which leads to some really hilarious banter and a great scene where he's disposed of. <laughs> and just like everything else in this movie, it wouldn't be the same unless he himself was made even crazier and more cartoonish. So he's a bat now. <laughs> West, you stupid biped! <laughs> yeah, in, in case you couldn't tell, the biggest flaw with this movie is the huge difference in effects in terms of quality. Some of the stuff looks so realistic and took ages to create. And if you watch any of the behind the scenes stuff, you can tell what went into all the effort that went into things like the bat and the puppeteering used for some of the limbs. But then you look at some of the green screen stuff. <laughs> now, thankfully, this isn't the end of the Reanimator series, but there are a couple films that were planned to be made, but never really made it past the plotting stages. For example, there was one called The Island of Reanimator, which would have used more human-animal hybrids and basically been a reworked version of The Island of Dr. Moreau. And there's an even crazier one called House of Reanimator, where the government contacts West after hearing about his experiments, and they convince him to reanimate the President of the United States. The fact that we haven't gotten either of these is criminal. And if there's anybody in Hollywood with a few million dollars laying around and a studio free for the next few months, contact Brian Usna. I want to see this happen. Are you saying that they're not quite dead? What's dead is dead, Lieutenant. I should know. It's my field. The Bride of the Reanimator isn't as good as the original by a long shot, but it is a worthy addition to the series. It takes what made the first film great and just keeps turning up the volume, making the characters, the gore, even the reagent itself that much more insane. And even if not all of it hits, it does a good enough job that it's still fun without getting too muddled. If you want a real Frankenstein story that takes itself seriously, watch a Frankenstein movie. But if you want a modern day retelling that isn't afraid to not skip over all of the gruesome little details and go a little nuts with it, please watch the Reanimator films.
Now, I know that there's a third reanimator movie in the series, and we'll talk about it eventually. Maybe when I celebrate my 100th video. But next time, we're going to take a look back at the Universal Monsters. I'll show you who I am and what I am. <laughs>